Welcome to Connecticut Compass Theatre Company's first Scary Stories Night. We're going to be reading some folklore, some fairy tales, some of our um, horror writer's most famous poems from John Keats to The Raven. So everyone sit back and enjoy. The intro will be read from the best book ever, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, collection from folklore retold by Alvin Schwartz, drawings by Stephanie Gamble. And you should go look the, these stories up because the pictures are what are even more frightening. Pioneers used to entertain themselves by telling scary stories. At night, they might gather in someone's cabin or around a fire to see who could scare the others the most. Some girls and boys in my town do the same thing today. They get together at someone's house and they turn out the lights and eat popcorn and scare one another half to death. Telling scary stories is something people have done for thousands of years. For most of us, in that like being scared in that way. Since there isn't any danger, we think it is fun. There is a great many scary stories to tell. There are ghost stories. There are tales of witches, devils, boogeymen, zombies, and vampires. There are tales of monstrous creatures and of dangers. There are even stories that make us laugh at all the scariness. Some of these tales are very old, and they are told around the world, and most have the same origins. They are based on things that people saw or heard or experienced or thought they did. Many years ago, a young prince became famous for scary stories he started to tell but didn't finish. His name was M Mamilius, and he probably was nine or ten years old. William Shakespeare told a story about him, The Winter's Tale. It was on a dark winter's day that his mother, the queen, asked him for a story. A sad tale's best for winter, he said. I only have one of sprites and goblins. Do your best to frighten me with your sprite, she said. You're powerful at it. I shall tell it softly, he said. Yon cricket shall not hear it. And he began. There was a man that dwelt by a churchyard. But that was as far as he got. For that very moment the king came in and arrested the queen and took her away. And so after that, Mamilius died. No one knows how he would have finished his story. If you started as he did, what would you tell? Most scary stories are, of course, meant to be told. They are more scary that way. But how you tell is important. As Mamilus knew, the best way is to speak softly so that your listeners lean forward to catch your words and speak slowly so that your voice sounds scary. And the best time to tell these stories is at night, in the dark and the gloom. It is easy for someone listening to imagine all sorts of strange and scary things. Alan Schwartz. Now the first tale I have for you is one that has been retold many, many times. It's called The Hook. Donald and Sarah went to the movies. Then they went for a ride in Donald's car. They parked up the hill at the edge of town from there, they could see all the lights up and down the valley. Donald turned on the radio and found some music, but an announcer broke in with the news bulletin. A murderer had escaped from the state prison. He was armed with a knife, and he was headed south on foot. His left hand was missing, and in its place he wore a hook. Let's roll up the window and lock the doors, said Sarah. That's a good idea, said Donald. The prison isn't too far away, said Sarah. Maybe we really should go home. But it's only 10 o'clock, said Donald. I don't care what time it is, she said. I want to go home. Look, Sarah, said Donald. He's not going to climb all the way up here. Why would he do that? Even if he did, the doors are locked. How could he get in? Donald, he could take that hook and break through the window and open the door, she said. I'm scared, I want to go home. Donald was annoyed. Girls are always afraid of something, he said, and he started the car. Sarah thought she heard someone or something scratching her door. Did you hear that, she asked as they roared away. It sounded like somebody was trying to get in. Oh, sure, said Donald. 
Soon they got to her house. Would you like to come in and have some hot cocoa, she asked. No, he said, I've got to go home. He went around the other side of the car to let her out. Hanging on the door handle was a hook. I have a story about political uprisings and that's pretty much the scariest thing we can envision happening. Remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. I know of no reason why the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Guy Fawkes and his companions did the scheme contrive to blow up the king and parliament all up alive. Three score barrels laid below to prove old England's overthrow. But by God's providence, him they catch with a dark lantern. Lighting a match, a stick and a stake, for King James' sake. If you won't give me one, I'll take two. The better for me and the worse for you. A rope, a rope to hang the Pope. A penorth of cheese to choke him. A pint of beer to wash it down. And a jolly good fire to burn him. Holla, boys! Holla, boys! Make the bells ring! Holla, boys! Holla, boys! God save the king! Hip, hip, hooray! Boo! <laughs> Thank you, Sean. So basically, they hung him. And it was quite sad. The Night Wind by Eugene Field. Have you ever heard the wind go, you? Tis a pitiful sound to hear. It seems to chill you through and through with a strained, speechless fear. Tis the voice of the night that broods outside when folks should be asleep. And many the many's the time I've cried to the darkness brooding far away over land and the deep. Whom do you want, O oh lonely night? that you wail the long hours through, and the night would say its ghostly way, you, you, you. The Hollow Men by T.S. Eliot. We, the hollow men, we, the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Alas, our dried voices when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless as wild in dry grass or rats feet over broken glass in our dry cellar. Shapes without form, shade without color, paralyzing force, gesture without motion. To who have those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom, remember us if at all not as lost, violent souls, but only as hollow men, the stuffed men. Those poems were about ghosts. Ooh. La Bella, a creepy bit of folklore. Oh, what can all the knight at arms alone and palely loitering? The sedge is withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Oh, what can all the night at arms so haggard, so woe be gone? The squirrel's ganary is full, and harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheek a fading rose. Fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head, and bracelets too, and fragrant zone. She looked at me as she did love and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long, for side long would she bend and sing a fairy song.
She found me roots of relish sweet, and honey wild, and manna dew. And sure, in language strange, she, she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept inside full sore. And there I shot her wild, wild eyes with kisses for. And there she lulled me asleep, and there I dreamed. Ah, uh, woe be tied. The, la the latest dream I ever dreamed on the cold hillside. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors and death pale were they all. They cried, La Belle Dame sends mercy, hath thee in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam with horrid warning gaped wide, and I awoke and found me here on a cold hill's side. And this is why I sojourn here alone and palely loitering, though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. I don't want to meet La Bella, ever. We have Mr. Mark Massey coming up to read several wonderful little stories, one of which I actually can't read because it still scares me to this day. The first story he'll be reading is The Big Toe. And the next story he'll be reading is Harold. And I actually remember reading Harold when I was a little kid. Hello. And then having a nightmare that he crept up to my window, and I swear to this day I saw that scarecrow. So, here's the first one, Mark. The Big Toe. Ah, yes. The Big Toe. A boy was digging at the edge of the garden when he saw a big toe. He tried to pick it up, but it was stuck to something. So he gave it a good, hard jerk, and it came off in his hand. Then he heard something groan and scamper away. The boy took the toe into the kitchen and shoved it to his mother. It looks nice and plump, she said. I'll put it in the soup and we'll have it for supper. That night, his father carved the toe into three pieces. And they each had a piece. Then they did the dishes and when it got dark, they went to bed. The boy fell asleep almost at once, but in the middle of the night, a sound awakened him. It was something out in the street. It was a voice, and it was calling to him. Where is my toe? It groaned. When they both heard that, he got very scared. But he thought, it doesn't know where I am. It never will find me. Then he heard the voice once more. Only now, it was closer. Where is my toe? It groaned. The boy pulled the blankets over his head and closed his eyes. I'll go to sleep, he thought. When I wake up, it will be gone. But soon he heard the back door open. And again he heard the voice. Where is my toe? It groaned. Then the boy heard footsteps move through the kitchen, into the dining room, into the living room, into the front hall. Then, slowly, they climbed the stairs. Where is my toe? The voice groaned. His door opened. Shaking with fear, he listened as the footsteps slowly moved through the dark toward his bed. Then they stopped. Where is my toe? The voice groaned. You got it! <sighs> but the big toe also has another ending. When the boy hears the voice calling for its toe, he finds a strange looking creature up inside the chimney. The boy is so frightened he can't move. 
He just stands there and stares at it. Finally, he asks, w -w -w What you got such big eyes for? And the creature answers, To look you through and through. What you got big claws for? To scratch up your grave. What you got such a big mouth for? To swallow you whole. What you got such sharp teeth for? To chomp your bones! Thank you. <gasps> This is the, the one that really, really frightens me. I don't care how old I get, this story always scares me. Harold. When it got hot in the valley, Thomas and Alfred drove their cows up to a cool, green pasture in the mountains to graze. Usually they stayed there with the cows for two months. Then they brought them down to the valley again. The work was easy enough, but oh, it was boring. All day, the two men tended their cows. At night, they went back to the tiny hut where they lived. They ate supper and worked in the garden and went to sleep. It was always the same. Then, Thomas had an idea that changed everything. Let's make a doll the size of a man, he said. It would be fun to make and we could put it in the garden to scare away the birds. It should look like Harold, Alfred said. Harold was a farmer they both hated. They made the doll out of old sacks stuffed with straw. They gave it a pointy nose like Harold's and tiny eyes like his. Then they added dark hair and a twisted frown. Of course, they also gave it Harold's name. Each morning on their way to the pasture, they tied Harold to a pole in the garden to scare away the birds. Each night, they brought him inside so that he wouldn't get ruined if it rained. When they were feeling playful, they would talk to him. One of them might say, How are the vegetables growing today, Harold? Then the other, making believe he was Harold, would answer in a crazy voice, very slowly. <laughs> they both would laugh, but not Harold. Whenever something went wrong, they took it out on Harold. They would curse at him, even kick him or punch him. Sometimes one of them would take the food they were eating, which they both were sick of, and smeared it on the doll's face. How do you like that, Stu, Harold? He would ask, well, you better eat it or else. Then the two men would howl with laughter. One night, after Thomas had wiped Harold's face with food, Harold grunted. Mm. Did you hear that, Alfred asked? It was, ha it was Harold, Thomas said. I was watching him when it happened. I can't believe it. How could he grunt, Alfred asked. He's just a sack of straw. It's not possible. Let's throw him in the fire, said Thomas, and that will be that. Let's not do anything stupid, said Alfred. We don't know what's going on. When we move the cows down, we'll leave him behind. For now, let's just keep an eye on him. So they left Harold sitting in a corner on the hut. They didn't talk to him or make or take him outside anymore. Now and then the doll grunted, but that was all. <clears throat> After a few days, they decided there was nothing to be afraid of. Maybe a mouse or some insects had gotten inside Harold and were making noise sounds. So Thomas and Alfred went back to their old ways. Each morning, they put Harold out in the garden, and each night they brought him back into the hut. When they felt playful, they joked with them. When they felt mean, they treated him as badly as ever. Then one night, Alfred noticed something that frightened him. Harold is growing, he said. 
I was thinking the same thing, Thomas said. Maybe it's just our imagination, Alfred replied. We have been up here on this mountain too long. The next morning, while they were eating, Harold stood up and walked out of the hut. He climbed up on the roof and trotted back and forth, like a horse on its hind legs. All day and all night he trotted like that. In the morning, Harold climbed down and stood in a far corner of the pasture. The men had no idea what he would do next. They were afraid. They decided to take the cows down into the valley that same day. When they left, Harold was nowhere in sight. They felt as if they had escaped a great danger and began joking and singing. But when they had gone only a mile or two, they realized they had forgotten to bring the milking stools. Neither one wanted to go back for them, but the stools would cost a lot to replace. There really is nothing to be afraid of, they told one another. After all, what could a doll do? They drew straws to see which one would go back. It was Thomas. I'll catch up with you, he said, and Alfred walked on toward the valley. When Alfred came to a rise in the path, he looked back for Thomas. He did not see him anywhere, but he did see Harold. The doll was on the roof of the hut again. As Alfred watched, Harold kneeled down and stretched out a bloody skin to dry in the sun. <laughs> Moral of the story, don't forget your milking stools. No use crying over spilt milk anyway. <laughs> now, Darkness. Darkness by Lord Byron. I had a dream, which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished and the stars did wander darkling in the eternal space, rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackened in the motionless air. Morn came and went and came and brought no day, and men forgot their passions in dread of this their desolation, and all hearts were chilled into selfish prayer for light. And they did live by watchfire and the thrones, the palaces of crowned kings, the huts, the habilitations of all things which dwell, were burnt for beacons, cities were consumed, and men were gathered round the blazing homes. To look once more into each other's faces, happy were those who dwelt within the eye of the volcanoes and their mountains torch, and fearful hope was all in the world contained. Forests were set on fire, but hour by hour they fell and faded, and the crackling trunks extinguished with a crash, and all was black. The brows of men by the despairing light wore an unhealthy, unearthly aspect, as by fits the flashes fell upon them. Some lay down and hid their eyes and wept, and some did rest their chins upon their clenched hands and smiled, and others hurried to and fro and fed their funeral piles with fuel and looked up with mad disquelt and on dull sky the pal of the past world, and then again which curses cast them down upon the dust, and gnashed their teeth, and how the wild birds shrieked, and terrified did flutter on the ground, and flap their useless wings, the wildest brutes came tame and tremendous, and vipers crawled and twinned themselves among the multitude, hissing by stingless, they were slain for food, and war, which, which for a moment was no more, did gulp himself again, and meal was brought with blood, and each state sullied apart, gorging himself in gloom. No love was left. All earth was but one thought, and that was death, immediate and Inglorious, the plague of famine fed upon all entrails. Men died, their bodies were tombless as their flesh. 
They, the mirage by the mirage were d- devoured. Even dogs assailed their masters, all save one. And he was faithful to a course and kept the birds and the beasts and famined men at bay till hunger clung them or the do- drooped dead lord their lank jaws himself sought out no food but with a pious and permutual moan a quick desolate cry licked the hand which answered not with a caress he died the crowd was famished by high degrees but two of an enormous city did survive and they were enemies they met besides the dying embers of the altar place where had been heaped a mass of holy things for unholy usage they'd ranked up and shriveled scalp with their cold skeletal hands the feeble ashes and the feeble breath blew for little life and made a flame which was mockery they that then they lifted up their eyes as it grew lighter and beheld each other's aspect saw shrinked and died even of their mutual hideousness they died unknowing who was upon whose brow famine had written fiend the world was void the populace and the powerful was a lump seasonless herbless treeless manless lifeless a lump of death a chaos of hard clay The rivers, lakes, and oceans all stood still, and nothing stirred within the silent depths. Ships sailorless lay rotting at sea, and their masses fell down piecemeal. As they dropped, they slept on the abyss without a surge. The waves were dead. The tides were in their graves. The moon, their mistress, had expired before. The winds were witherless in the stagnant air, and the clouds perish. Darkness had no need of aid from them. She was the universe. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, Suddenly there came a tapping, as of one gently rapping, rapping, at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember. It was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly. I wished the morrow vainly. I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore, and the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me and filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before. So now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This is it, and nothing more." Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, I said, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is, I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door. That scarce I was heard you, here, opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, 
and the only word there spoken was the whispered word. Lenore? This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word. Lenore, merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obstance made he, not a minute stopped, or stayed he, but with the mind of Lord of Lady perched above my chamber door. Perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancying into smiling. By the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, though thy crest be shorn and shaven thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim, an ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night Plutanian shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear it discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little revelancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. With such a name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking. Fancy unto fancy, thinking, what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fall whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press ah. Nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed with an unseen censer swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tuft floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite, nispent from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind neth, and forgot this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, think of evil. Prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or tempter tossed, be here ashore, desolate, all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this 
home of horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore. Is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird or devil. By that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of thy soul has spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door, quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, is still sitting, is still sitting on the plowed bust of Pallas just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shout, shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. That is an excellent segue into my last story of the night called The King of Owls by Lewis Edrich. It's said that playing cards were invented in 1392 to cure the French king Charles the Seventh of madness. The suits in some of these first packs were consisted of doves, peacocks, ravens, and owls, the king of owls. They say I am excitable. How could I not scream? The Swiss monk's tongue spun till it blurred, yet his eyes were still. I snapped my gator hard to stuff back. My mirth, lords, he then began to speak. Incus cantardum, he said, presenting the game of cards in which the state of the world is excellent described and figured. He decked his mouth, as they do, a solemn stitch, a left card and left cards in my hand. I cast them down. What needs have I for amusement? My brain's a pack. Yet your company plucked them from the ground and began to play. Lords, I wither. The monk spoke right. A merely wrench. The sorrow pattern show the device's construction of your minds. I have made the deuce of ravens my sword, falling through your pillows and rising, the wings, blades still running with jaguar blood. Your bodies lurch through the steps of an unpleasant dance. No lutes play, I have silenced the lutes. I kept watch in the clipped, convulsed garden. I must have silence to hear the messenger's footfall in my brain. For I, the king of owls, where I float, no shadow falls. I have hungers, such terrible hungers you cannot know. Lords, I sharpen my talons on your bones. November 5th, 2018.